All right, uh, welcome to uh, this monthly meeting of the Google User Group. Um, we'll be getting started in about five minutes, so if you're watching this video recorded in the future, you'll probably want to jump up about five minutes uh, to get to where we're actually going to begin. But thanks for being here, and we'll talk to you soon.
and I'll unshare the screen. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Well, welcome everybody uh, to our January 2016 uh, Google User Group meeting. Uh, thanks to everybody who's here in person, uh, those that are watching online live, and um, the folks who will watch the recording in the future. It's uh, fantastic to have all you guys here with us. A um, little bit of housekeeping as we get started. Let me share my screen. And as always, nothing different here. Um, the key thing you need is the agenda, and that can be found at google.apps.spark.org slash user group. You can also get it off of the event page and uh, probably have it a few other places, but honestly, this is probably the easiest central place to go to uh, get to that agenda. So it's our um, Spark Google Apps web page where we put a lot of our resources. So at google.apps.spark.org slash user group, if you go there, it takes you out to this page. And um, there's a lot of other stuff on this site, but it takes you to specifically our user group page. And if you scroll down, you'll see our agenda or excuse me, our schedule for this year. And today's is the January 22nd meeting. And as you go across, you'll see uh, the meeting agenda. So the link here to the Google Doc for the meeting agenda can be found. Uh, again, that's google.apps.spark.org slash user group. Grab the agenda from there. As always, it is editable. So guys, feel free to put whatever in there you want. I mean, uh, if you have a question, there's a Q&A section. If you've got something to share, please throw that in the show and tell section. Um, as you scroll down through the document, you'll see those are a little bit further down. There's a Q&A spot there. So any questions you have, throw them in there and we can chat about that here. And then the show and tell, just scroll on down and find a, a spot in there and feel free to wedge in whatever you would like to share in the show and tell section as well. All right, and if anybody can't get to something, let us know. Give us a holler. Um, so uh, just for the benefit, I know the folks sitting here um, are <laughs> well aware of how this works. But if somebody's watching this live and this is your first time watching it, I do see we've got a number of people viewing this live at the moment um, or if you're watching in the future. So what is this? Basically, once a month, we try to get together in person and online uh, to chat about Google. And it kind of covers two different groups. Um, specifically, uh, I work at a uh, organization called Spark uh, with Anthony, my colleague. Say hi, Anthony. Hi, Eric. Oh, very good. And uh, Anthony and I work here at Spark. Spark is a information technology center up in Northeast Ohio. We serve about 30 school districts, uh, many of which use Google Apps. And so this is part of our service to our local school districts to provide them with Google Apps uh, updates. But it also uh, crosses over into what's called GEG Ohio, uh, Google, the Google Educator Group of Ohio, something that Google asked that different states, or that all states and countries set up. Um, we also are part of uh, the Google Educator Group for Ohio. So this kind of covers both of those categories. But honestly, anybody can watch. I don't mind where you're from. <laughs> you can be from any city, state, or country. We welcome everybody to this meeting. Um, there are a whole bunch of you know links and stuff here. I am not going to go through these other than just to point out probably the only one that's of great importance under the important links section is the sign in form. Uh, as always, we do ask that people please do sign in. Uh, I know I'm a little behind on sending out these certificates. I'll, I'll, I'll do that this afternoon. I'll get the ones from the last meeting sent out. Uh, but there is a sign in uh, form LinkedIn. Here, let me zoom in a little bit so this is a little bit bigger for us to see here. There we go. If you scroll down to important links, there's a spot that says uh, tiny.cc slash gug dash sign in like Google user group sign in. If you guys would go there and give that a click, that opens up a very simple form. Basically just need a little bit of information about you, the date of the meeting, obviously today's, and whether you were here in person at Spark or online. And then we do ask if this is your first time attending. And these questions are actually from Google. Uh, they ask that we report these numbers back to them. We do not give them like email addresses or anything like that. All that stays private, but they do want to know um, 
how, how many attend our meetings and if it's new for them and so forth. The reason I collect your email address is because I, I send out a certificate of attendance. So you'll get like a two hour uh, certificate of attendance PDF so you can turn that into LPDC for attending the meeting. So that's why I do ask for who you are and where you're from. Uh, Google just needs to know some of this other information. So I definitely appreciate you guys filling that out. And again, you can do that whether or not you were here live or online, or even if you watch this as a recording, that's okay, it counts. I mean, if you sit through a, a two hour recording and you listen to all of it, that's great, that's that's attending, and so that's perfectly fine. Uh, so there's a lot of other important links, please feel free to check all those out, they're all very valuable and nice stuff, but uh, that's the one that I, I need you guys to be aware of. So um, again, the most important link is uh, to get to the agenda at google.apps.spark.org slash user group. Um, and then the next important uh, link would be uh, the sign in. All right. All right, so that's pretty much what we need to do to uh, get the meeting rolling. Uh, what we're going to do is pretty much our, our normal approach. We've got um, a little bit of updates. We're going to talk about some upcoming events. We're then going to spend a chunk of time talking about what's new in Google. Each month we always say, okay, well, what did Google roll out in the last month? And there's a, you know, a decent amount of stuff. Uh, some of these things are kind of small and we'll probably skip to them faster. Some we'll spend more time on if they're a little bit more impactful. After that, then we have our Q&A section. If anybody has questions, that's great. And then finally, we have our show and tell. We do have a special guest with us today uh, online. Uh, Jamie Chanter uh, has already joined us. I can see she's in the hangout there. So we'll pull Jamie in. She was so fortunate. Lakewood City Schools got to do a Google expedition. Uh, they came there. So she's going to tell us all about it, how that went. And we've got some other neat announcements from Google about expeditions as well. So I'm really excited to hear from Jamie and uh, what she can share about their experience with it. And then there's some other show and tell things in there. Again, we're not going to go through every one of those. Please don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> but we just got a lot of them you know, linked. Some we'll just reference and let you know that they're there. Others we may dig into a little bit more. And then Anthony has uh, always his uh, searching um, uh, tidbits at the bottom. All right, so let's get going. Um, before we start, any questions, comments? Anybody here? Everybody good? All right, excellent. All right. Um, so, uh, updates. Um, we always like to chat real quick about the user group to say how it's doing as far as growth and so forth. Uh, we do have two different user groups, like we said, that are being represented here. Uh, one is the Spark Google user group, and the link to that is in the agenda. And that is a Google Plus community um, where you can go to ask questions, share resources, connect with educators. Uh, we're currently up to 570 members there, so that is fantastic. And and then GEG Ohio, same idea. GEG Ohio is a Google Plus community where, again, you can go and you can ask questions, share resources, connect with people all around the state of Ohio. Uh, we're up to 886 members there. So it's a fantastic way to get in touch with others, to ask questions, to learn, to stay in the loop on things. So we would definitely encourage folks, if you have not yet joined one of those groups, join one, join both. Uh, you're welcome to uh, plug into either or both of those uh, communities. With upcoming events, um, I guess we probably, we didn't put, again, we always forget to put the conferences, but we've got OET coming up. That's the Ohio Educational Technology Conference. That's early February. And then we've got um, Neotech as well. That's on the horizon. And I forget exactly the date when that is. Maybe, Anthony, if you want to cross-reference some of that and... March 10th, you've got it, fantastic. So March 10th at Kent State University, the Neotech Conference, very similar to the Spark Conference that we run here in August, uh, free, um, great, you know, lots of wonderful sessions uh, by educators, for educators, uh, neotechconference.org. Correct. Okay. And uh, unfortunately last Friday was the last day for proposals. Okay. So they've closed proposals, but obviously the next thing will be to attend. So is there a registration to attend or? Yes, there will be. It will fill up, so it fills up? Yes. Okay, Anthony, I don't know, if you, about 400 people can yeah. fit? Okay, so I mean, that's great, but that, I mean, it could fill up, that definitely could. Anthony, if you get a moment, maybe even throw those under the upcoming events, if you want to put a link into the Neotech one, because obviously OETC is right around the corner, that may be a little too late for some people to still uh, attend if they haven't gotten that uh, arranged by now, but Neotech, they want to keep that on their horizon. And also, too late to really plan for, but just want to mention the Ohio Science Institute has a yearly conference, 
and it's taking place month um, Tuesday the 26th. And I know next year they're moving to a larger venue, so you may want to watch for that for all the science teachers out there, the Ohio Science Institute. Okay. We will post it on our upcoming calendar okay. when they start doing proposals and things, but I know they're going to a larger okay. venue next year. All right. Well, that's fantastic. Well, yeah, Anthony, if you can throw some of those uh, conferences in the upcoming part, that would be fantastic for people. Uh, here is the website for the Neotech conference. All they're saying about registration is early 2016. So um, we don't have registration open yet. Uh, but um, I know Anthony, I'll be there. You'll be there. Um, it's a great, great conference. All right. Uh, other upcoming events. Just a reminder, we try to do a couple webinars a month. We're not going to do a bunch in February because of OETC. Uh, that really is going to take a chunk of our time out. Um, and so we're each just going to do one. Uh, so Anthony still has a webinar for this month. Anthony, would you like to tell folks about the one you're doing here next week, the fabulous features in Google Docs? Yes. Um, I know many, but I don't have to talk to the converter already, but many people out there think that Google Docs is just a simple little word processor like WordPad with spell check added. And uh, it's actually a lot more. And the interesting thing we're going to be covering is the fabulous features that are in Google Docs that are not in other word processes, no matter how much you pay for them. And uh, I think there'll be something there for everyone uh, that's probably new to them. They may have never noticed before. We're going to do at least 10. And if we have time, I have nine bonus items. So uh, get ready for some fabulous features uh, in Google Docs. I'll give you a little preview. One of the most important features we're going to cover is the ability to do research work, uh, research work for writing a term paper or that, that research paper. So we're going to talk a lot about that uh, as one of the fabulous features because it has a lot of features that will assist you in that. Excellent. So great, again, great for people that are perhaps new to Google Apps and they are still trying to uh, get used to the suite, um, or even somebody who considers themselves a seasoned user but is wanting to pick up another tip or trick they maybe didn't realize, oh, Google Docs does that. Well, that's great. Um, and then you've got another one as well in February. You're going to be doing one on virtual field trips? Yes, we had to move the virtual field trips back because we were afraid of a snow day. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoops. I must have the wrong link on that one. I'm sorry. I may have the wrong it, may, it may have gotten mixed up in the changeover, but that's going to be on February 23rd. And uh, it's moved. it was originally scheduled for the 28th of January. Right. And the idea on that is we're going to look at some ways that you can uh, take your class on a virtual field trip. Uh, you may be already aware of things like uh, Google Lit Trips. Uh, that's just going to be one thing we're going to touch on. We're going to touch on some available field trips and also how you can set up your own field trips and create field trips that other people may want to go on. So uh, that'll be February. We'll probably still have snow, but it doesn't matter because it's virtual. All right. Well, we'll get that link fixed um, as well. Um, after you put the conference yep. stuff in, if you want to go figure out what that link was, I'm sorry, I must have grabbed the wrong one. Um, I'm doing one in February, and mine is basically going to be behind <laughs> the scenes of of what we do, of making webinars. Uh, we've decided to make a webinar about making webinars. So basically, here's the thing. If you guys um, would like to provide video training to your staff and you're looking for some hints and clues and best practices, what this session is going to cover is, quite frankly, everything we did to build our webinar system, all the tools we use, how we use Hangouts, how we use YouTube, sites, forms, add-ons, docs, all the different things that we cobbled together because again, we're just using free tools. Uh, different folks use different things and that's fine. There's lots of great commercial products out there for creating video content for your uh, trainings. We are broke, so <laughs> no, no, but we, we're always trying, we're cheap, we're, we're frugal, we're frugal. Yeah, you know, we always try to find a way to do frugal things. Googlers. The frugal Googlers, I think you've just coined the term, that's it, we're the frugal Googlers. I love that, that's fantastic. Um, because yeah, I mean, try, always try to find a way to do it for free. And so we're gonna show you basically how we've done that. Um, so we've been doing this for a year. We started back in December, so just a little over a year, December of a year ago. And we've produced about 30 
webinars. And they're by the end of this month, they'll probably have close to 40,000 views on those webinars. And so they're getting a lot of great use. A lot of teachers are being impacted by them. And so uh, that webinar is going to explain to you how you can mimic that sort of a thing if you would like to do that with your staff. So definitely feel free to register for any of those. It's always obviously free. If you can attend live, that's fine. We have a, a doc you can chat in during the webinar. But if you want to watch it later, that's fine too. You can still register so that you stay in the loop on how to easily view it afterwards. All right, so that's some upcoming stuff. You guys have anything else we need to know about? Anything else coming up? Upcoming events that we forgot about? Neotech, uh, OETC, we've got the webinars. It'll be a while. Uh, May will probably be the Ohio Google Summit, but that's still a ways away. So, all right. All right, that sounds good. All right, let's keep on going then. We're gonna switch over now to what's new in Google Apps. Again, we're not gonna hit every single one of these things. Uh, some of them are kind of small. We might just mention them in passing, but we just like to keep you guys in the loop on anything that came through our news feeds over the last month that we noticed about uh, new things with Google Apps. Uh, first one, really quick, not going to spend much time on this, but if you're using a uh, Chromebook, if you're using Chrome OS, um, just for those of you that are aware about VLC, VLC is a uh, media player that most of us who use um, you know, a traditional computer, not a Chrome computer, definitely enjoy. I've used VLC for many, many, many years. It's the one that looks like a traffic cone. Uh, it's great for playing pretty much any video out there. Uh, they have released a version of VLC for Chrome. So, I mean, it's not like massive news, but I thought that was kind of neat because that's definitely something that um, uh, a lot of folks are used to on a traditional computer having VLC, and I thought that was really nice that VLC is now available for Chrome OS. All right. Um, next up, and I'll tie a couple of these together, Google is continuing to work toward uh, virtual reality, 360-degree videos, um, all of that, and we've talked about that with Cardboard. That's been one of the things we've talked about, Google Cardboard, the expeditions, things like that. So there's just a couple of announcements in here that kind of tie to that. So for example, um, if you did not get a chance to try this out, back around Christmas time, Google released a really cool 360 degree animated interactive video. And um, it was called um, Special Delivery. And basically, if you went to view this on just regular YouTube.com, you could watch it. I mean, it would just be, you know, a video. It's cute. You could watch it. But if you instead watched it on your phone, it tied into the motion of your phone. So as I was watching the video on my phone, I could start moving my phone up, down, around, and it would let me look around the scene. I could look at different buildings, I could look at different people, I could look at different things that were happening, and it was in incredibly immersive. And so if something, you know, if I decide, oh, I don't want to watch what's happening there, and I turn my body physically and look the other direction, it'll start up a new storyline in a different part of the video. They had like, I don't know, 50 or 60 different storylines woven through it, and you can just keep looking around. And so it, the immersion of it is what really I thought was just awesome. And so Google's really pushing toward this whole immersive uh, virtual experience. And they're adding more and more of this sort of stuff on um, YouTube, but also for cardboard, also just for your mobile device. So if you haven't tried that one out, I know it's past Christmas now, but it's, it's, it's really a neat experience. I would encourage you just to try it out so you can see what it's like. And then if I jump down a little bit, uh, another thing that kind of goes along with this is that YouTube is partnering up with GoPro. Uh, GoPro is the uh, you know little video recording thing that you uh, hook to a headband usually and put it on your head. Uh, we do have one at home, um, and we've used it for oh lots of different stuff. When we go sledding, you know, I'll put it on, put the headband on, and we all go down and wreck, and it's great. I actually tied it once to a kite, <laughs> and we took our kite flying, and we had the GoPro hanging from the kite, and it was cool. We were all down there waving at it and stuff like that. So GoPros are cool. Well. YouTube is now partnering with GoPro to uh, produce more um, 
uh, video that's VR. And if you can see this picture, you can see it's a whole bunch of GoPros all connected together around in this array. And so they're wanting to make a whole lot more 360 degree immersive videos. So uh, start watching for that on YouTube. You're going to start seeing a lot more of these videos where it's not just one static camera shot, but you're able to move around and see lots of different parts of what's happening around you at that time. Um, and I did not add it as one here, but there was a, another announcement that Google has now hired somebody as their head of VR. So they do have a VR, you know, uh, person in charge of all of that now. So big thing, you know, that's something they're, they're really pushing for this year. And I think we'll see a lot more of this immersive type of stuff with other tools coming out. You got uh, Facebook bought the, the Oculus Rift uh, virtual headset. Then um, HTC has the Vive or the Vive. There's all these, you know, coming out. So I thought that was cool. Uh, and we'll hear more about expeditions with Jamie. Uh, in just a little bit here as they got to experience this in their classroom. Uh, next one real quick, uh, somebody mentioned that uh, on TechCrunch, they mentioned that Google is beginning to test password-free logins. And so the idea of how this works is just, I'll give you the, the, the general gist of it, is that you would have to have, to use this, you would have to have a device uh, like your phone uh, with you, and that when you go to log in to um, a computer, all you'd have to do is put in your email address, and then buzz, buzz, your phone would buzz, and an alert would pop up saying, we notice you're trying to log into a computer. Is this you? Is that okay? And you would just hit okay on your phone, and you would not actually have to put your password into the computer you're at. So, um, whether or not this would ever, you know, affect the education world, I don't know, but passwords is something we always deal with. Uh, students either forgetting their passwords or people not picking good passwords. Uh, and so I think that's interesting that if you did have devices available like a phone, an Android phone, an iOS phone, something like that, um, as the way to authenticate who you are, um, you you know, we, perhaps we could start to see that even get into a school setting. Um, right now, they're in a beta period of testing this out. So people were able to sign up. And I don't know if there's still a way to get into the uh, beta group. But uh, I just thought that was neat that uh, they're looking at alternate ways to get around the traditional password. Uh, this next one, I don't know. Let me see. I don't know if I can, I can see if I can bring this up. Um, the... Um, Google search, uh, a lot of times when we um, type in things to the Google search box, we get uh, instant results. So like, I think most of us are aware of this. So for example, if you go to run a Google search and you say something like um, uh, area of uh, rectangle, um, uh, and we'll say something like, um, I don't know, two by four, um, it'll pick that up. And it'll say, oh, hey, it looks like you're trying to find the area of a rectangle. We'll make it two by four. And it'll actually, uh, you know, oops, that was the area. So, whoops, I guess I should have done length by width. That's okay. But area of a rectangle, we'll just do area of a rectangle. There we go. So length times width, we'll say it's two by four. And it'll actually calculate that for you. These are, I don't know what you call these. Anthony, is there a name for these sort of things when Google gives you this instant result rather yes, than having is. to go into the yes. actual pages? I, I don't know if they're calling them like they were calling them cards, cards, knowledge cards, or something yeah, like that. They, they, I don't know whether that's yeah. still the name, but I know they were calling them cards, pop up cards, knowledge cards. I've heard a couple different names. I'm not sure if there's an official one out there. Well, now if you search for bubble level, uh, in Google search, you will actually get a operational level. And of course, it makes sense to do this on your phone. Um, now, I don't know, I usually can bring my phone up on the screen. I'm going to, I'll try it real quick and see if I can. If I can't, I apologize. I should have tested this out ahead of time. Uh, let me fire up my Reflector 2 app and let's see if I can convince it to allow me to put my phone up on the screen here. And if so, then we'll do that. If not, that's okay. If if not, we, we we won't. But we'll give it a quick shot here and see if it will let me do that. Um, let's see. 
going to tell it to cast the screen, and it does not seem like it's seeing it. Oh, okay, that's fine. I apologize. Uh, but as you see from this uh, picture here, uh, that is exactly what happens. It actually gives you an operational level, and if you take your phone and you move it left and right, the little bubble moves around, and it even gives you a percent uh, or excuse me, a, a degree that you're off of center. So if you if you need to do some work and uh, you're trying to get something level, hang a picture. <laughs> Just grab your phone now and simply type in bubble level in the Google search box on your phone and you'll get a usable level. Kind of cool. I like that. All right. What else do we have going on here? Uh, let's keep heading down the line here. Chromebooks. We've got about three announcements on Chromebooks. We'll cover all of these at once. Acer, Asus, and HP all announced their uh, new Chromebooks coming out. And the big theme is ruggedized. That's like the thing now, Every which is great. I'm so glad. Um, the first big ruggedized ones came out. Um, about a year or so ago, I've got my CTL uh, Chromebook here that uh, I've used for, for quite a while. It's one of the ruggedized ones. It has the handle. It's got a waterproof keyboard. It's got a reinforced exterior. Uh, th these are really nice, but now those are like a year or so old, and this is like our second generation. So if we take a look, uh, Acer is putting out theirs. Um, and I think I've got the prices on all of these as well. So the Chromebook 11 from Acer is going to be ruggedized. All of these are ruggedized, meaning they can take a drop from several feet. The keyboards are waterproof, water resistant, however you might want to look at that. Um, they've got, uh, they can withstand a lot of pressure on top of them. Like, I don't remember, some, one of them here said, what was it? Um, uh, it's in one of these, I'll have to take a look and see, but it was like, 60 pounds of pressure or something like that sitting on top of it before the screen would start to have any damage, uh, which is really important because kids will stack books on their Chromebooks and things like that. Um, so the first one here, the one that is from uh, Acer, the price point on that is $179. So, I mean, a rugged Chromebook, now at the price we used to get traditional Chromebooks. So that's fantastic. So $179 for the Acer. The Asus, the next one down, it um, is the C202. And I think the price is pretty close as well. Let's see. Um, doot, 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 doot. 199 so 179 for the Acer the Asus 199 for that one and then the last one further down was HP they just announced this one this one is hot off the presses just like two days ago uh, their Chromebook 11 education edition and um, let's see it has a price at 199 so we're looking at 179, 199, and 199. So um, fantastic options for schools that maybe then don't have to buy a protective case for their Chromebook, which could add extra cost to it. The Chromebook itself can be its own uh, protection. So that's great. Um, so happy to see those. Uh, anybody here looking at buying some more Chromebooks here in the near future? Yeah. Well, definitely uh, consider these uh, options for you to help keep them alive. All right, what else do we have here? So that was the Chromebook stuff. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, just a quick uh, update. Uh, if you have high school seniors uh, graduating that are interested in science, there is still time for them to apply for Google's 2016 Computer Science Summer Institute. Um, so this is, again, for uh, graduating high school seniors with a passion for technology. Um, and it is held, let me see, it's held in the summer, but there was something on here about how long, here we go, application deadline is March 3rd. So for those that would be interested in applying for that, they have still a little over a month, month and a half uh, to apply. So just something to send out to your uh, high school teachers to let the students know about that may be interested in that computer science summer institute. While you're taking a breath, Eric, I've added the sessions that Eric and myself are presenting at EOTC so you can come and uh, 
you know, harass us during the session. Oh, what we're doing there? Yes. Oh, cool. You didn't yeah. know what you were doing, did you? Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll be doing one on teaching math with Google Drawings. I'll be doing the one on the, uh, the webinars. I'm also doing um, something It's not really a traditional session, uh, but we're doing a Google versus Apple fun competition. <laughs> it's going to be four uh, Google certified uh, innovators or trainers versus four Apple distinguished ed ed educators, ADEs, and it's going to be a game show kind of thing. So that'll be fun. Um, uh, I'll have to throw some details in about that for people that want to come watch, <laughs> watch that uh, showdown. All right, let's keep on heading here. So what's up next? Um, uh, we keep mentioning each month that Google continues to highlight schools around the country. Um, I have not seen a highlight for Ohio yet, so they keep letting us know that they would like to hear what awesome things schools are doing. And so usually they mention, uh, share your story on Twitter or Google Plus and either uh, tag at Google for EDU or use the hashtag Google EDU so that they'll be aware of the awesome things you're doing. So if you are doing some neat things in the state of Ohio, please do let Google know either with the Google for EDU um, account or the Google EDU hashtag so you can perhaps get included in their highlight of Ohio when they do get to us. Uh, another small, a lot of these are kind of small. We'll spend some time on some bigger ones later, but these, some small ones. Uh, Google Resources. So if you use the resource calendar, and I don't know, does anybody here do resource calendar? No? Uh, it's, a, it's an option. A resource calendar is a way to book um, a lab or a cart or, you know, anything that you want people to be able to sign up for in your school. You can use resource calendars. In the past, though, if you did set up a resource calendar, it couldn't be, uh, you couldn't use the option to see only free and busy. People had to see the full details. It had to be a completely viewable calendar for your staff. Probably not a problem, but I guess there could be some privacy concerns if there was something for whatever reason you didn't want people to see on that calendar. So now you are able to set resource calendars to the option see only free busy and people can still book on the calendar. They'll just see the spots that have been taken up, but they won't know who took them up. They won't uh, see any other details other than it's either available or not. So I thought that was cool. All right. Uh, this next one, let's actually camp out on for a little bit. So on the 12th of January, Google announced that they were updating a uh, Google Drive with how you can organize your files. I was really happy about this one. This one definitely is a step in the right direction. So here's what they've done. If you go to your drive, um, it, you now have easier, I think, easier to understand options for either moving something from shared with me into your drive or moving something in Drive into a, a different folder. It's just a little clearer than it used to be. So let me go to Shared With Me, for example. So here I am, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into Shared With Me. When I'm in the Shared With Me folder, I've got all of these different files in here, and if I start clicking on them, you're gonna notice I now have an icon up here in the top right. Let me zoom in a bit, see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Okay, there we go. In the top right, I've got an icon that sometimes looks like a folder with an arrow on it, and then sometimes it looks like a drive icon with a plus on it. Here's the idea. If you go to Shared With Me and you click on a, a file, if it's got this icon, the Move To, that means it's already in your drive. It's Sure, it's in Shared With Me, but it means you already put it in your drive at some point. You drug it over, you moved it to your drive. It's letting you know it's already there, but hey, if you would like to put it somewhere else, simply click this and now you can pick where in your drive you would like to uh, locate it. And you can go down and move it to a folder in your drive. If it is instead one where it's not been in your drive yet, it's just a little bit clearer now that this needs to be added to your drive. Now remember, we that's not totally new as much as the fact that now it's a very clear thing, move to versus 
add to my drive. So if you click the add to my drive button, that will again let you choose the folders. This does not change the fact you can always just drag and drop. That works too. That's, that's no different. You can still just drag and drop from shared with me into your drive, but now you have that clear differentiation. Where else has this shown up? Well, here's another option. Let's say you have a PDF or anything that's not a Google file. So it could be you know, a Word file or whatever it might be. I'll just grab this PDF from Anthony. If I open up this PDF in preview mode, I now get the same icons again. So now from preview mode, I can say I wanna add this to my drive. And again, if it's been added to my drive, I can then move it in my drive as well. So that's cool. The one I really, really liked is they've added this now in the searching as well. So if I search for something, I say, okay, let's search for PDFs and let's actually, let me look for, I'll just do this. I'll look for the one that Anthony had, the plagiarism one that he sent me. So let's say we search in, uh, and so here's my search results. If I go to my search results and I click on this uh, PDF that Anthony sent to me, I can add it to my drive from there and I can drag from here now. I never could do that before. You could not drag files from the search window. It was a quite an inconvenience. If you found something through search, you couldn't do anything with it. <laughs> you were It's like, oh, I found it, I can open it, but you couldn't just drag it where you wanted. Well, now this whole system of add to my drive, move in my drive, drag and drop, the point is it's now consistent. It doesn't matter if you're in your drive, in shared with me, in preview mode, or in search mode. All of those modes, you can now move things around so much more consistently. So hopefully that will help people as they're using Google Drive to organize their files better. Now Anthony, oh, so go ahead. Yeah. It sure is. Um, I, I now I mean that was the 12th we're on the 22nd as usual they'll say you know this is available on rapid release like here it says launching to rapid release with scheduled release coming in two weeks so if it says two weeks and that was the 12th yeah sure yeah that would we, we're not two weeks yet that'd be the 26th so it is possible if your domain I know I know we've talked about this before but if you go into your admin console uh, you can be either on rapid release or on scheduled release. Um, so from the Google Apps Admin Console, there is um, that option under, oh, is it the company profile? I always forget where it's at. Um, I'm sure it is. Is it maybe? I always forget where it's at. Yep, it is. Yep, company profile. So under company profile, there's a section there that says new user features, rapid release or scheduled release. I've got our Spark domain on rapid. A lot of schools don't because they don't want something to surprise their teachers. They wanna know, okay, I've got two weeks breathing room between when Google announces this and when it starts showing up. And that gives me enough time to give my teachers a heads up. So if you're on scheduled release, that's perfectly fine. There's no reason to switch off of it, but um, this is gonna be a really nice feature as it does roll out. Now, Anthony, you did a webinar recently on Google Drive that if people really wanna go deeper into it, I know it's further down in here, but it might be worth just letting them know under the show and tell, yes. we do have LinkedIn, this one on navigating Google Drive. Yes, and I've updated the slide presentation. Of course, I did not update the webinar because I didn't wanna record it, but the slide presentation, uh, that goes along with the webinar has been updated. One of the things I wanted to mention Oops, is that's the cheaters one. That's wrong link, okay. Yep, you got the wrong link. <laughs> um, one, one of the things I want that. to mention while you go to the link is um, some of the tools can be confusing when you're first starting out, especially on the preview screen, because they adapt to you depending on what type of file it is, whether you've already saved the file, whether the file's been shared with you. So just be aware that the screen does not always look exactly the same when you're going into the uh there's the link all right the preview screen especially all right so um that recent webinar you did on navigating google drive has been updated with a slideshow to incorporate this new information but of course 
Google's a moving target, yeah. so as soon as you do a webinar, they're going to change something. And Eric and I discussed this yesterday. A lot of our, our Google webinars do change over time. So we, we've we been trying to add some of the resources. So if you go to the resources with the webinar, um, a lot of times we have those updated. That's a good point. We're not going to re-record the webinar, obviously, for something that just changed. Maybe if the webinar is a year old or a year and a half, we might. But we may just add in the resources below the updates, you know, what has changed since we recorded it. All right. Uh, next up, Google Cast is now going to get baked into Chrome. Now, what's that? Google Cast is the um, currently an extension you can install that lets you cast your uh, Chrome browser to a Chromecast to be able to show it up on the TV or projector or so forth. All they're saying is you're not going to have to have the extension, that um, they will actually have the Chromecasting support built right into the Chrome browser, and nobody will have to go out and grab the extension. You'll just be able to cast your tab automatically. So that's nice. Now, Anthony, you discovered this next one. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Kaizena as far as, uh, for those that don't know, you know what it is, I guess, to start with, but also this change that they've just gone through. Well, first of all, to let you know how fast it changed, I was getting ready to do a program, and I set up the information on Friday of the previous week. And on Monday, uh, much to, I, did not under, I did not realize at the time, but they changed the announcement brought that they were changing from Kaizena shortcut uh, from, I'm sorry, from Kaizen Mini, which was the, the extension for uh, the add-on add for, for uh, Google Docs to Kaizen Shortcut, which is basically their web-based program that's been available all along. So what they're doing now is they're directing everything from the web-based tool. So before Kaizen, you simply opened up the add-on and you were able to go into a document and insert, just like you insert a text comment that you were able to insert a voice comment, which is really nice. Um, they changed the way it works now. So um, I've not had a chance to really try it out a lot, but what you do now is you take your document and you upload your document into a group. Now the groups uh, will automatically be created if you have classroom enabled. Uh, so your classroom groups already show up. So it's just a, a way of organizing things a little more. And they're adding additional features um, into this ver version of it. And one of those is the ability to annotate directly on the document with your mouse. You can red circle things now and um, put big red stars on them for, for the, your good students. Um, so if anyone's used it before, I have put a link on my uh, website uh, under the World Languages section, because that's what I was doing this for, on a help page. And that's the very page in Ericsson right now. You can also get to it very easily from the Kaizena page. But yeah, and I got the yeah, I got the link right there. Session. So you probably, if you're using Kaizena, you're going to want to go back and go through the help. Now, in the transition, if you have documents that you created with Kaizena that you utilized Kaizena on earlier, the comments will still appear the same way they did before, but you cannot add to them or change them. So the big change is Kaizena used to be an add-on that lets you add voice comments to a document while you were in Google Docs. It was just a panel on the side. The new version of Kaizena looks like the old version from way back when it first came out, because that's how it used to be. It didn't used to be an add-on. It used to be its own website. You had to go to kaizena.com, you know, and you had to basically import your document into their system, and then from the side, you could do all these things, adding comments to it. Well, they're back to that. And my guess is they probably just felt like they were running up against limitations in Google Docs because, Anthony, you mentioned things like being able to come in and circle things and underline things and annotate right on top of the document. We see this feature a lot in LMSs. We've recently been doing some uh, LMS evaluations here, looking at Schoology and Canvas, and both of those, they let you do that. If you have a document, you can throw it into the LMS, a student uploads it, or they, they, they turn it in. You as a teacher can open it up in the LMS, and it takes a snapshot, it takes a picture of that document, and puts it in their own grading tool, where in Schoology or Canvas, you can take your mouse and you can write right on top of the document and circle things and X things out and you can leave voice comments and you can uh, put a rubric in and all those sort of things. My guess is 
Kaizen I probably wanted to do more of that kind of stuff. That's and right. in Google Docs, right now, the most they were able to do was you could leave text comments, voice comments, links. That was fantastic. That was great. But there was really no way until Google Docs gets some kind of an upgrade to like annotate on top of a document. So by doing this, anytime you have a Google Doc, you can now send it over to Kaizena. It takes a snapshot of it. You can then write on it and do all these other things. So that's my guess as to why they moved back to this format. Now, there is a workaround if you want to utilize another tool and follow in the same steps. It's, a little, it's not quite as elegant, but I found an extension called Talk and Comment Voice Notes Anywhere. And I'll put a link to that. Um, it's a part of the World Language section, so I'll actually put a link to my World Languages page because that has a lot of things I'm recording. What that does is it makes a recording and then it gives you a URL. So you can paste that URL into the comment session section. Sure. You could click on that URL and hear the sound that way. Excellent. Uh, another step, but it's another way to do things. So okay. I will post a section on world languages because it has a lot of things on recording and some add-ons for voice and recording for Chrome and in okay. some cases docs. Now I see we got a question. Do the students have to have the add-on to hear the voice comments? If it is Kaizena, yes, that's always been the case um, with Kaizena, even when it was the add-on. Uh, they had to have the add-on installed. So, um, for example, if somebody opened up a Google Doc that had Kaizena comments, they did not show up in the margin like a regular comment that you would see in a Google Doc. What you would get is a little note at the top of the document that says, your teacher has left comments with Kaizena Mini. Please open up Kaizena Mini from the add-ons above. And so they had to have the add-on. The same thing will be true here. If they open up the doc, they're not going to see any of this in the doc. They're going to see, I'm assuming, again, a note that links them over to kaizena.com where they're going to need to, uh, when you say have an account, it's not like you really have an account. You just sign in with your Google account. So um, yeah, it's going to rely on the kaizena tool. Actually, one of, the, one of the differences is when you, that group that you create or that group that's created for you, uh -huh. it's going to give your student a join code so they can become part of that group. So I think they may not need to actually do it because they're going to become part of that group. So well, they go back to the document. Okay. Uh, that's why I said it's, it, you need to read through the help, but I'm not well, a chance to. The point the being, document. though, it won't be, you won't see this in the document. The live right. Google document does not actually have the comments. They, it, Kaizen takes a snapshot of the document, throws it into its system, and that's where you see them. The only place I've ever seen that not be the case is with, uh, is with read and write for Google. And um, I guess, I mean, I can show you again real quick, probably just turn it on real fast to get here. If I come in here and I turn read and write back on, and if I go ahead and reload this, so read and write shows up, give that a quick reload. Um, when you do voice comments with read and write, it does add them as comments over on the side inside of the doc. So if I come in here to read and write, and if I go to the voice note feature, and I record a voice note, testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. And if I insert that, we'll see if that comes through okay. It was running really slow the other day, oh, a lot faster now. You'll see over here on the side, it actually puts that as a traditional comment with just a play button on it. So that's one of the really elegant things about read and write for Google is you don't need a separate program. If you're doing just voice comments, it actually embeds those as a, 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 a link to play it right inside. And here, I'll hit play and we'll see if it plays for us. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Yep, just as simple as that. So that I think is pretty slick. I think that's, that's pretty nice and that's uh, using read and write. Now keep in mind, read and write is not free for kids. It is free for teachers. Uh, it does have a, 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 a smaller cost for students. Um, there's a free version of it that has some of the buttons for the kids, just doesn't have all of them. But if you were a teacher leaving comments, this is totally free for you as a teacher. So you could use read and write to add voice notes at no cost, and the kids don't need read and write to just hit a play button on the side. They're just hitting the play button, it's playing the comment, uh, the voice comment right on the side. All right, good stuff. Let's keep on heading down. What else is new? Um, doo, doo, doo. let's see. 
Uh, probably not a big one. Just if you're an administrator for Google Apps, you can now turn off um, the prompt when inviting external guests to Google Calendar. So if you've got a calendar event and you invite somebody who's not from your domain, normally it pops up and says, these people are not from your domain. Are you sure you want to do this? Eh, you can turn that off now. So not, not real big, but all right. We'll talk more about expeditions in a while uh, when Jamie comes up. So I'm going to jump over that one for a moment. I won't cover that. Um, Google Science Fair, coming back around, 2016, Google Science Fair. There is a link uh, that Google posted in our GEG Ohio um, community. If you follow that link, you will see they got some information about the upcoming Science Fair. And right now, all they have is a link to get notified of updates. So they say, hey, join our mailing list to hear more about it. If you go to that link, it's just going to say the 2015 one has, has been closed, but if you'd like to learn more, please put your email address in here. So just basically they're saying, hey, we'd love to keep you in the loop on the science fair. You can sign up to receive notifications. They're just sort of getting us aware that this is on its way for this year. All right, what's next? Keep on heading down the list here. Um, Chrome is uh, adding a new algorithm to make web pages load even faster. <laughs> you won't have to do anything about it. It'll just be built right into Chrome. Uh, there's an article there explaining that they've now added uh, some new algorithms to even further improve the speed of Chrome. Uh, we already talked about HP. Uh, probably don't need to spend too much time on Google Cultural Institute. We've mentioned it at many of our previous uh, uh, user group meetings, but it turned five years old this month. And they had a nice uh, blog post about how they have now passed 1,000 museums that have their information, all their content uh, into in the Cultural Institute. So basically, if you are not aware, the Google Cultural Institute is a website where basically they have tried to collect as much digital representations of fine art as they can. So whether it's paintings, they've scanned them in at incredibly high resolution. You can get closer than you ever could in an actual museum. Like you can see the brush strokes, you can see the individual little teeny flaws and everything. They've done this for paintings, for sculptures, for all sorts of things, and it's organized beautifully. So the Google Cultural Institute, over 1,000 museums and cultural institutions have had their collections digitized and brought into that. So happy fifth birthday to the Cultural Institute. And the last update before we move into Q&A and show and tell is Evernote announced that as of today, this is actually the date, the 22nd, January 22nd, Evernote is discontinuing a very popular, here I'll bring up their blog post, a very popular add-on called Clearly. Uh, they also are doing the same for um, Skitch. Um, I did not use Skitch. Uh, it's to annotate on images from what I understand. I have not used that, so I can't speak to that. But Clearly, oh my gosh, I use Clearly all the time, and it was one of the great ones to show schools. Uh, what was Clearly? Well, basically, Clearly is an extension. I'll just show you. And I've still got it installed, so it's not like gone since I've got it installed. But if I were to go to a website like Dogo News, student event, a uh, student current event website, it's got good articles, but it's also got a lot of distracting stuff all over the page here, clearly allowed me to simply come up, click on my clearly extension, and it would reload the page and strip out everything except for the core content, the images and the content that the students should be reading. Really good for kids to help them focus so that they're not distracted by everything else there. Good for adults too, so we can just read the article we want to read. Well, the thing is, Evernote says they are going to focus just on their core products, and they did not consider Clearly and Skitch to be core products anymore, and so they are discontinuing them. What that means is if you've already got it installed, it'll still be there, but it'll no longer get updates, so the chances are over time it's not going to work properly. As web pages continue to evolve, Clearly will not evolve with them, so it probably won't continue to clean up all the web pages you go to. If you don't have it installed, 
well, you won't be able to anymore. It just is not going to be in the Chrome Web Store. So it's being discontinued. So what I did was I went ahead and this link that I've got in here takes you to a blog post I put up <clears throat> about alternatives for Clearly. We don't need to go through these uh, in any great detail other than to let you know that if you follow this link to my blog post, you will see that I talk about four different alternatives. So there's readability, Beeline Reader, Easy Reader, and Read Mode. And all of these do something similar to what Clearly did. The best of the bunch would be readability. I will show you that one just because it is so similar. It looks like a little chair here. If I go to Dogo News and I go up to my little easy reading chair up here, click on that, you will see I can say Read Now. And when I do, it reloads that page very much like Clearly did. And again, it's all nice and cleaned up. I just have the text. I just have the images. And just like Clearly let me do, I can go to my little themes button over here, change the font size, change the image size, change the font itself, change whether it's a dark background or light background, very much like what Clearly did. So I think it is a perfect replacement for that um, if you still want to have something that does that. Then there's others like Beeline and Easy Reader and Read Mode that have some additional tweaks and things to it. So, uh, And there's a little video here that I take you through all of those to explain how each of those work and the pros and cons of each. Yes? And while Eric was researching this, we came across another little tool that doesn't really do this, but it's sort of neat. It's called Announcify. Yep, I've got that one right here. Oh, very yeah. good. Yeah, Announcify. Um, and here's the thing I really appreciate. When I posted this, a lot of folks commented um, here or there, some of them in this, saying, oh, here's another great one. Take a look at Purify. Take a look at this. Take a look at that. Uh, Announceify showed up. There's Announceify. And so we got some really good feedback from people on the blog post as well saying, here's one you forgot or this one might work well. Announceify is similar in that it does clean up the page, but it also reads it aloud to you. And you kind of have to have it reading it aloud. Um, that's really what it's designed for. So if I go ahead and I'll turn on Announceify here for you. You are now listening to China's Spectacular Carbon I Said Snow Festival expected to attract over a million visitors hits news article. Being famous for having one of the most bitter winters in China and most likely the world does not sound like a good... Now I'm going to pause that for a second and you'll notice what it does. Announceify cleans up the page, but it also it um, gr it uh, blurs out everything except what it's reading. So you can't actually just scroll down and read the whole page now. You have to let Announceify read to you, and it will only read a paragraph at a time. Well, it'll read the whole thing, but as it reads each paragraph, it'll unblur just that paragraph. So that's a really neat tool doesn't quite do what we need as far as being able to read the page on your own with it being cleaned up, but it does read it to you a lot like Speak It or Read and Write for Google as well. I think it's nice also that it gives you sort of, it makes it sound like it's a newscast. So I think, I, I, I sort of like that. I played around with it a little bit last night and it's sort of dramatic, it gives a little bit of dramatic air to just reading. Yeah, it says you are now listening to, and yeah, it tells you the name you're, of it. You're, like you're tuned into some yeah. distant station. Yeah. All right, well, that gets us to the end of what's new. We're going to move to Q&A and show and tell, but let's pause there. Any questions on anything that we hit on the new stuff? Or do you guys, did you guys hear something new, something we forgot, something we missed that's come out in the last month? No? All right. I always think we're not going to have a whole lot of news and always a few days before from the 18th through the 22nd. It's always like, oh boy, we don't have a whole lot. Then suddenly, boom, <laughs> they dump all these updates on us within a week of our meeting. So uh, they they know we're having a meeting today. Google, Google follows this, I'm sure. So they uh, make sure they get these things announced in time for our meeting. Uh, all right. So uh, at the moment, we don't have any Q&A which is fine. If somebody does have a question, feel free to put it in whenever. We're going to move to show and tell. And Jamie, I'm going to go ahead and give you a, a couple of moments here to get yourself situated. And I'll give a quick introduction. But we're going to start off with Jamie uh, talking about um, what they did with Google Expeditions. Um, so as she's getting all prepped there, I will let you know that I did skip that one news article uh, in the what's new in Google that Google has now opened 
a sign up for yeah. the beta of the Expeditions app. Now you might recall Expeditions has been around for a while now, at least a year or so, and Expeditions involved you getting chosen by Google for them to come physically to your school, or I don't know if they're there, but the divide, well Jamie will tell us how it works, but you get uh, Google Cardboard, you get um, you know devices to put in the cardboard, I think you get a tablet that you can then use to, to uh, run the expeditions, and the kids all get to do this 3D virtual uh, field trip experience. And it was very limited. Basically, Google was you know moving these around the country, around the globe, bringing this set to schools, so you had to get chosen as they brought their road show through. Well, you may remember last month, we did our Google predictions for 2016, and what was one of my predictions? That Expeditions would become something you could download as an app, that if you had the devices, you wouldn't have to wait for Google to bring it to you. You could just download an Expeditions app, you could download an Expedition, you could push it out to your kids. Well, it sounds like it, within 20, within 19 days of 2016, I check one of them off, Anthony, I got a point already, because it sounds like this is what's happening. Uh, they've got uh, a sign-up a sign up form here, and they've also got an article here that says that uh, Google is now opening up sign-up for what they're calling um, the Expeditions app. And so if it's an app, then that does sound like the idea that you can actually download the app, right? Their participants will download the app to Android phones and tablets to engage with it in class and offer feedback. So yes, it does appear uh, that is the case. You will not have to wait for Google to come around to your school. You'll be able to just download the Expeditions app. There's a link in our agenda for you to fill out this. So please do go to the Expeditions beta link. It's the first link there, right after where it says Google opens the sign up for beta Expeditions. Fill in some information about who you are, where you're at, submit that, and you'll get in the queue to hopefully be allowed to download that. I filled that out for Spark, uh, so hopefully they will um, let us do the same as well. All right, so at this point, uh, we're going to bring Jamie on, and she's going to talk all about their experience at Lakewood. So um, I'm going to do a couple of things here. I'm going to mute myself uh, so that I'm not uh, overtaking Jamie. I'm just going to turn it over to her, and then I'm going to uh, sh let her uh, have the uh, share the screen. So let me go ahead, and I'll make you the presenter here, Jamie. So now you're the presenter, and I'm going to... Um, Go ahead and move this over so the people that are physically here can see you as well. Yeah. All right, uh, so let um, me turn that over to you now. Have at it. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm sorry, my uh, 3D printer is being super noisy, so it's almost done. I was going to pause it, but then it would mess it all up. So hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, I've got my Google Cardboard here uh, just to show you. It's nice and easy, and I want to just show you really quick how you put the phone in. It's just Velcro, and this is what they brought to us when they came, and I'll show you all about that, but you just put your phone in, and then it's all set. That's, that's it. All you have to do and is just raise them up to your eyes, and they have a couple Google, um, sorry, I should have silenced that. They have some um, apps already out there that you can use um, with your kids and with your students, so I did... I should throw this link in there also. Oh, I need to share my screen. Sorry. I'm a little off today. Let me get back there. Let me share my screen. There you go. Okay, so what you should be seeing now is this Amazon page. Just showing you how cheap it is to just get one of those devices. Just to play around with. Very cool. Um, you know, you can buy really nice ones. And Viewmaster even has one now that is not too expensive. It was like one of the hot Christmas items this year. It's like $27 or something like that. All right, so if I go back to what I wanted to show you, I put a link in the document. Here it is. This right here is just the video I'm going to show you in just a second. I want to explain to you the process first. Like Eric said, we 
filled out a Google form a long time ago. I think I filled it out in like August, maybe September, mm -hmm. asking Google if we could be a part of the Pioneer um, Pioneer Group or whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. And we were accepted. We found out mm -hmm. about a week before Christmas break that we were accepted and they gave us a couple of dates to choose from. Mm -hmm. I chose one date and they said, nope, you can't have that one. It was already scooped up. Can you do this one? And we said, of course. So we had the um, Google people come actually the day after we got back from break. So we came back on Monday and then Tuesday was our Google Expeditions Day. And Lakewood's a very condensed district. We have, we're a walking only district. We don't have any busing. And so um, what we did, because Google asked that you had 18 classrooms and you couldn't have kindergarten or first grade because they have an age limit restriction, no children under seven can use the Google Expeditions software and, and hardware and I think that's because of the whole 3d business I don't know if any of you have kids with the Nintendo DS and they advise against children under seven using 3d so Google expeditions did the same and they said no children under seven can be a part of this so we had to get classrooms second grade through fifth and we just didn't have 18 classrooms and I was afraid it would limit our cho choices and actually they said if you don't have enough kids we're not coming because they want to make it worth their while. So what I did was I combined two of our schools. We have um, two schools within a half mile and so the one school walked down in like half hour increments and they, w and they got to participate as well. So we ended up um, getting two schools to experience Google Expeditions. All the grades um, two through five got to come and their teachers and it was a great experience. Um, it started off a little rocky. The the way it, when you set it up, you fill out the form, they give you the date, and then they send you all these things that you have to fill out. You have to fill out a schedule. You have to choose the expedition that you want your teachers to go on. And because ours was so t such a time crunch, we went, you know, it was over Christmas break that I was doing this, and no teacher wanted to talk curriculum over Christmas break with me. So I just assigned... I looked through the standards and I said, you know, I know fifth grade is working on biomes right now, so we're going to look at biomes for their expedition. And I know that second grade just did a unit on sharks, so we're going to look at sharks for them. And so I just kind of assigned different expeditions because they sent me a list of, you know, nearly 150 different expeditions that the kids could choose from. Or not the kids, the teachers. But like I said, the teachers were on break and I didn't want to bother them. So I chose for the teachers. And then I had to submit all of that and the schedule, and I had to recruit two people that would devote their entire day to help this expedition. And I did all that, got it all set. Google arrived Tuesday morning a little late. They were supposed to be there at 8, and things got crazy with traffic, and they got lost. And so we missed our teacher meeting, our teacher training meeting. I had the teachers all ready from both schools. One was doing a Google Hangout and the other school was live waiting for the trainer and she never arrived. So that was kind of a bummer, but we just shared some resources about what we knew so far and got the teachers ready to go. So then when um, our Google person arrived, she had um, myself and our media um, specialist help set up the devices and all that entailed was turning on phones and they brought um, a Google phone that hasn't been released yet. That's what they brought. They brought 60 phones and 60 of the little Jeez. cardboard devices. Jeez. And we set them up. We put the phone in the device, just like I showed you with the um, Velcro. You just put it in there, and we turned the phone on, and that was basically, oh, and we turned the app on. That was all we had to do. And then in addition to the 60 phones, there were two tablets. So we could run two different sessions at the same time, 30 in each. So we had two rooms going um, with this adventure. And the tablets were, you know, like mini iPads, that same size. And I don't remember which kind of tablets they were, but they were they were specifically for the teacher and they ran the expedition. So it was nice because the expedition would be on sharks mm -hmm. and it would have off yeah. to the side these controls yeah. that teachers could use to, first of all, it gave you a lot of information. So if I didn't know a lot about sharks, I could just read off mm -hmm. all this information to the kids and they would get 
great information and it's kind of scaffolded too you know like easy medium hard I, I would like to see that be improved a little bit because it was all very high level I was struggling with a lot of the information for the second and third graders it was too high even the easy was a little too high for them for some of the expeditions so that's definitely an area I would love to see growth um, also okay so I'm gonna show you the video now just so you can see what it was like for the kids and this links in the thing so you can look at it later It's just two minutes. It's quick. Okay, so you could see just a little bit of the excitement that the kids went through, and it was just so exciting. This link here will bring you to the um, our school district's website, and they just ran a little article about the expedition that we went on. Um, when it came down to it, when Google got there and we got everything set, it was much looser than I had imagined, given the contact that I had had between Google. And myself, it all seemed very structured and very serious. But once um, we had the Google representative arrive, it was very loose and easy. You know, the assigned expeditions that we chose, we could change it with just a click. It was no problem at all. So, like I said, it was our second day back. We did not have lessons prepared to um, go along with these expeditions. They say, like, you know, this is just a part of a lesson. This is like a 15, 20 minute experience that you should add to a lesson. We didn't have any of that ready. The teachers were just fresh off break and we just treated it as, you know, an extra fun experience. And the teachers were able to see, though, what an opportunity this would bring into their classroom and how they could create lessons or units to revolve around it. So, our next step is hopefully bringing these into our school and we did sign up like Eric signed up for the spark group I signed up for my schools as well and hoping to hear from them interested to see what the cost would be and how it would work um, we have Chromebooks and iPads in our district so I don't know um, how that's gonna work I'm assuming we'd have to buy some um, very cheap phones or low iPad touch iPod touches, um, some cheap devices like that, and I, I'm thinking we would start off with uh, a school set that we could, you know, kind of 
bounce around from room to room, but it, it was definitely a worthwhile experience. And these kids were just so excited and the teachers were so excited. So it was definitely something I would encourage people to try. Um, we have another two schools in our district that are going to experience it next week. When um, I had my expedition, the, I invited two teachers from two teachers in my same position from the other buildings and they came over and were able to finagle a date out of um, Google. So they are getting this experience next week. And um, again, it's going to be the morning at one school and the afternoon at another. So it's really nice that a lot of our Lakewood kids can go through this. But like I said, you can get that um, real cheap cardboard off Amazon and use your phone and try it yourself. It's awesome. Really cool. So that is, oh gosh, I don't like when it does that. Let me um, unshare my screen. That's about all I have for the expeditions. Um, oh, one thing that, you know, looking for room for improvement, they do not have um, sound yet. The sound wasn't working. So it says, you know, this you'll get this ambient experience or something like that it says but you don't the sound doesn't work yet so hopefully that is improved also because we just we didn't have headphones or sound or anything we just had the kids with the um cardboard devices which they were calling google goggles i don't know if that will change either but that's all i have oh i'm, I'm sorry i keep saying that's all i have in line um google did send us these little notebooks i just got them today they're pretty cute and i think the kids are going to be super excited because they were apologizing for them being late. So that was super nice of them. I always love some Google swag. So that's all I have now. Oh, that is fantastic. Thank you so much for, yeah. uh, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, so if I understand correctly, to move forward with this, um, schools will need to have Google Cardboard, which you're saying is like 15, 20 bucks. I've got one. I've brought it into some of our meetings here. Uh, they would need a device to put in it. Uh, iOS or Android could be a phone, could be maybe a Galaxy player, you know, something, you know, 100 bucks. Uh, who, who knows? It doesn't have to be real crazy. Um, and then the teacher should be able to run it probably off of any tablet that they would have an, an iPad or an Android tablet. Right. Um, and hopefully all the expeditions will then be uh, free to download. I mean, I'm hoping that's the case with it. Um, so is, is that your understanding? I, I I think so. Yeah, I totally agree. I hope that Google's be going to be coming out with some sort of kit where you can buy the devices and the cardboard together and make it nice and easy. Oh, there's also, um, they brought a router so that all the devices connected just to that um, it was, you know, a small router. That way, we didn't have to worry about using our Wi-Fi, or if the Wi-Fi went out. There, and there were, it was super smooth. We never had any issues like that. So they did encourage use of a router dedicated direct, directly for the expeditions. So. Um, and then I, I guess a um, couple other last little things. You mentioned there was no sound. Uh, that's a little strange because I know that um, when I've done cardboard. Um, there was sound perfectly fine just coming out of my phone, you know, that I put in there when I did some of the right, right. Um, little ones they give you to try out. So I'm sure they'll get that fixed. Yes. Um, and then um, the article you guys have on your website about it, uh, if you don't mind, please throw that into the GEG Ohio um, community as, as a post. Go ahead and just sure. maybe share that article. I think people all around the state of Ohio would appreciate getting to read that article. And lastly, I think it was hysterical that Google got lost coming to your yeah. uh, building. Uh, they, I don't know, they weren't using Google Maps or, or what, but uh, no, they drove the Google car and uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't find us. It was very, um, it was kind of disappointing. I was frustrated, but it turned out all at, all great in the end. So, so thanks you, thank you so much for doing that, but also for uh, always being here and sharing with us um, and sharing the day as well. I really, really appreciate that. Thanks so much. Well, feel free to hang out, and if there's anything else you got to share today, you know, chime in, whatever. But whenever you need to leave as well, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. All right. Thanks so much. You bet. All right. Let me go ahead and. Uh, Readjust now and get everything moved around here. Share my screen again and pop that out for everybody to see. All right, there we go. We are back in business, I do believe.
All right, there we go. Uh, so uh, that was Google Expeditions. Um, after that, as far as um, any other show and tell that we have here, um, we're, again, we're not going to. I'm not going to go through all the stuff I put in there. Just wanted to uh, make you guys aware of a few things. Um, so, for example, there's a neat idea, a neat story here talking about Google Cardboard and 3D. This goes along nicely with it. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read this story, um, it's on a bunch of different websites, um, and it's about how some doctors used Google Cardboard to um, do an operation and save a baby's life. Now, there's a video that comes up and tries to play here. I'll pause that. Uh, but there's a great video that goes with it as well as an article. And so the idea is um, they had this, uh, there's this baby that had a significant uh, defect with its heart and lungs and needed um, surgery. And the doctors quite frankly said, we're sorry. I mean, this is beyond what we believe we can do. And they literally sent the baby home to, with the parents saying, you know, just love it. And, it, you know, it's not going to have a, a real long time here, you know, but, you know, it, it, expecting it to pass away shortly. Well, after sending the baby home, I'm not exactly sure, you know, you have to read the article again to remind, you know, who was it that got the idea. But one of them said, well, hang on a second. You know, what about this? And um, so what they ended up doing was they had done a scan, which, you know, that's very common now, uh, 3D scanning, like, you know, a CAT scan or an MRI or whatever. They had done a scan of, of the baby, um, and they said, could we do this? Could we take the scan, and could we load it into a 3D viewer and use Google Cardboard to look at a 3D view of the baby's internal organs. And so they did that. And then all these doctors sat around a table with cardboard up to their face, looking around, moving, and looking at all these different angles. And once they were able to look at the scan of the heart and lungs, they got ideas they never would have had from what they kept saying, the normal 2D images they get just didn't reveal what they needed to see. Once they saw the 3D images, they were like, hang on, we have an idea. We could do this, and then if we do this, then we could do that. And they said, bring the baby back in. They did a surgery, and they said it was so clear to them exactly what they needed to do because they could see all of it in the 3D from the Google Cardboard, and they saved the baby's life. <laughs> it just, I just think that's phenomenal, you know, that 3D imaging is being used in so many ways, and uh, with just something as simple as a... $15, $20 Google Cardboard uh, device, uh, this this child's alive. So uh, it piggybacks nicely on that as well. So I thought that was really cool. Okay. Um, next up, let's uh, hit just a couple of quick things here. And then um, I see we've got some other things that have started to get added and lit further down. I want to make sure we give time for you guys as well. This is something we've noticed over the last week or so. It seems to be um, a change in how Google converts PDFs to Google Documents. Um, in the past, so let me fire up my drive here again. I go to Google Drive, and if I search for a PDF, and I'll grab one that I own here. Let me get one of my PDFs. In the past, if you had a PDF, like here's a sample scanned document. So this is uh, just an old uh, doc that I, or old uh, uh, flyer I put on the copy machine, scanned it as a PDF, put it in my drive. In the past, if you had a PDF, you could right click on it, go to open with Google Docs, and it would convert that PDF into a Google Doc. Even if, even if it was just scanned, it would do OCR. It would read through and find the A's, B's, C's, and it would pull the letters out, and it would convert it into a Google Doc. Now, it still does the conversion, but we're losing something we used to have. It used to be when you would do a conversion like that, it would also bring with it a image of the original. So you would have an image of the original, and below that, you would have the actual OCR text that was pulled out. That way you could look at the original, look at the conversion, go back and forth and go, oh, it got this wrong here, let me fix it. Now, if I come here and I say, take this sample scanned PDF, open it with docs, it will convert it, 
but I just get the converted text. I no longer get the image of the original to compare it to. So it's just, there it is, there's my converted text. I don't get that image anymore. I've not seen any announcement. This is nothing that we got any kind of press release on. Somebody on Google Plus mentioned it, said, hey, this is weird. And then we've been trying it out and we're seeing the same thing. The only thing we have found is if you try to convert not a PDF, but like a PNG or a JPEG or something that's an image that has text in it, it does still give you the image in that case. So if I go to, and if I say, you know what, let's find not a PDF, but let's find an image of some sort. And if I go find an image, and uh, I don't know if it has to be owned by me, probably any image will be fine. I can probably find a good image here. Uh, let's find an image with some text in it. So like here's an image that has some text in it, okay? So there's just, it's just a picture. That's a uh, PNG. If I come here and I say open that with Google Docs, it will again go through and do the OCR to pull out the text, but it does leave the original picture. So I get my uh, image, there's my, it's really big, I can shrink it down a bit. I get the original picture, it actually brings it into the document, and then below the picture is where it has the OCR text. It pulls, it pulls that text out of there. It used to do that for PDFs, now it doesn't. So I'm kind of bummed out by that. Um, I, I kind of liked the fact that you got the original because on a scanned PDF, sometimes things don't convert perfectly and it's nice to be able to look at the original. So heads up, that may not be an option anymore. So I guess you could always turn your PDFs into images, but that's an extra step that seems kind of unnecessary. But anyway, all right. I don't. I did not put this one in. Who who added about a new rugged Chromebook that converts into a tablet? Yeah. What do you know about that? Oh, I just I just came across it recently. I didn't know. It didn't look like you had that particular one. No, I don't. In your yeah. So you say this is, so it folds, yeah. and um, is it touch screen though? Or does it just fold into the shape of a tablet for easier? Oh, but that's great though, That because see, that's one of the big issues with breakage is pushing the screen beyond the limit of the hinges. And if it will fold like that, oh yeah, there you go, it bends all the way back 180 degrees. So that's a great way to, again, avoid busting those hinges that... Um, yeah. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, we're seeing things under $200 that are now ruggedized. Excellent. Um, and then, um, actually... Let me skip over some of our stuff. We'll come back to it. I just want to preserve time here. Uh, Marlington, um, why don't you guys chat a little bit about this? I see you say you've converted 24 Dell laptops using the Cloud Ready tool, and you're testing them out in the field. I'll turn the microphone towards you, and hopefully I'll pick you guys up decent. We took a classroom set of Dell 6400s uh, that were not working real well uh, and consistent, uh, and wiped those when you brought that up. Two or three months ago about cloud ready coming out and yeah. um, our network manager took that and ran with it and took 24 um machines got them wiped and ready to go and working really well um and we deployed them into a classroom yesterday as a matter of fact um, yeah. and we're leaving the classrooms for a week or two and then we're gonna just keep shuffling them around and see how they're how they work how the teachers like them, and, and if they're working well, we're going to pull the Dells out of that room, convert those cloud ready, go to the next classroom, and kind of um, keep working around. Now, but did you do the free version, or did you also pay for the management? They're just the free version. Just the free right version. Now, just to see how it works. Perfectly fine, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I am so glad to hear that. Um, so... 
for those of you that don't remember, it was a couple months back. We actually had, uh, we were in the, in the NMK lab for that particular meeting. <laughs> we're in a different room every time we have a meeting here. Uh, but uh, we talked about Cloud Ready. It's not a new product. I mean, it's been around for a while, but it's really been improving a lot. Um, and I actually did an article on that, which if you look right above Marlington's post, my third bullet point down here on recent blog posts, I went ahead and did a blog post on that, turn your old computers into Chromebooks. And if you go to that, um, that article, you'll see I talk all about Cloud Ready and basically how there's a free option and then there's a paid option. Um, and that basically what you do is you take an old laptop, an old desktop, and you either boot it from a USB memory stick that has cloud ready on it, or you boot it from that and then choose to install it onto the hard drive of the computer. Um, either way is okay. Um, and at that point when the computer boots up, it's booting up into basically uh, Chrome um, OS. Now it's very much like a Chromebook, of course, but um, there are a few little differences. Like uh, I mentioned the look because it's technically Chromium, which Chrome OS is built off, based off of. The icons are different colors. So like Chrome is blue <laughs> and the app store is blue. <laughs> the actual icon itself, uh, here's a picture of it. <laughs> They're actually blue <laughs> instead of the regular color because it's Chromium rather than Chrome OS. But I mean, they're that's what Chrome OS comes from. And of course the keyboard isn't gonna match up a Chromebook. If you're using an old whatever, you know, Dell, HP, whatever, you're gonna have F1, F2, F3 keys. You won't actually have keys that have the reload button image on them or the screen brightness image or whatever. The point is though, that the function keys still work like the Chromebook keys. You just have to remember which one does what. Now remember, you can always press uh, Control, Alt, um, question mark. Is it, uh, control, control, alt, question mark, I think is what it is. That'll pop up the onboard um, keyboard shortcut menu for you. So if you forget what keys are supposed to be what, you can cheat by looking at that. Um, and then, of course, I thought speed wise, for me, the ones I've done felt like a little bit of an older Chromebook. They didn't feel as zippy, but that's because when I did it, I tried this on two devices. I did a 2007. Lenovo laptop and a 2009 triple EPC. So, you know, we're talking something that's, you know, nine and seven years old and they ran fine. I, I could have used them. I mean, it was a little sluggish, but it ran fine. Um, and ever since posting this, and I go through the whole process of how to set it up and how it works, uh, we've gotten tons of feedback. We got a little bit of posts here on the website, but I also sent this out as an email, and I got so many people writing back saying, me too, me too, me too. It's really taking off. There's a lot of schools that are taking advantage of Cloud Ready. And if you just wanted the free version, basically you've just got a Chromebook now. If you wanna pay, there is a cost, to be able to pull it into your admin console and enroll it and manage it like a Chromebook. So you'd have to kind of weigh that and decide, is it really worth that? Or is it just fine to have a whole bunch of free Chromebooks now? Well, good. I am so glad that worked for you guys. Um, we hang on to things at schools a long time and we try to keep them alive. <laughs> so this gives us a little bit more life out of those old devices. Well, keep us in the loop on how that goes for you guys. All right. Um, so other than that, a couple of other, um, uh, show and tell things just wanted to remind you guys, um, that we have done some recent webinars that are now in the can. You guys can grab these at any point. I did one recently on Gmail safety and security for schools. So if you're a Google apps admin, this is really not, this would not really be for teachers. This would be like, you're an admin. If you're running the Google apps, uh, you know, um, for your school district. This tells you how to go in. This webinar is all about how to tweak your email settings for your kids, like bad word lists, um, things like who kids are allowed to email to and who can they get email from? Uh, can they send email outside of your domain? All of those settings, this goes into how to manage that. So uh, if that applies to you, please take advantage of that. And then I just did one... When was this one? Just on the 19th, so a couple of days ago. Wow, it feels like forever. <laughs> I, just, I just did one on cheating. <laughs> so this is Cheaters Google Apps Edition. Uh, I just did a webinar 
all about addressing student cheating. So uh, lots of ideas about what a school can do, what teachers can do to help prevent cheating in a digital world and what you can do to investigate it if you think oh this doesn't look right I think something might have gone on here all the tools Google gives you uh, to be able to help prevent and investigate cheating um, it's not a gotcha type of a webinar it's not about oh let's catch those bad kids it's really all about how can we help those those students make better choices, make them aware that Google tracks everything, and so they should not be copying and cheating and so forth, uh, but we do spend quite a lot of time looking at a lot of Google features and tools to help with cheating. So that one is available for you as well. I just wanted to mention something on that. Even just letting the students know about these facilities is a good way to deter some of the cheating that takes place. So just let them know that you... Oh, yeah. You this should not be a secret. You guys should not be, like, waiting to pounce on them. I mean, the kids need to know. Guys, if you're using Google Apps, every email you send, it's in Vault. If you're posting in Classroom, every post you put is saved. If you're creating anything in Docs, Sheets, Slides, Drawings, Revision History has it forever. If a student deletes a file, your Google Apps administrator can restore deleted files and bring them back. Uh, Vault lets you search all the drive files across your whole domain. They need to know Google Apps is not the place to harass other people, to uh, be inappropriate, to violate academic uh, integrity policies, to cheat and so forth. Um, so uh, definitely that'd be a great one. If you've got teachers that are a little bit reluctant saying, I don't know, and I'm just talking just Google, but they're reluctant about technology. You know, I don't know. There's just so many more ways kids can cheat. Now, that is true. I will give you that. There are more ways to cheat with technology, but you also get more ways to prevent it and more ways to track it. If you're passing notes in class, I don't have a technology solution to track that. I can't stop a kid from talking to another kid in the hall. But with technology, we do have a lot of other tracking options we don't normally have. So uh, definitely uh, take advantage of that. And then Anthony, you did two of them here recently that you wanted to at least uh, mention. The one on searching was search tools beyond Google, right? Yes. So just lots of other tools besides the regular Google search that people might want to try. Yeah, that's going to be my show and tell here. Okay, the, great. The, the second one I did was uh, was um, stepping out of your searching rut. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, na navigating. Was, sorry, yeah. sorry, never mind. The second one I did was navigating Google Drive. That was a, little, a couple, about a month and a half ago. Okay. It was before Christmas. And uh, I just brought that up again because it brings back the same idea of what we talked about earlier about manipulating objects. And also some people may notice when you went to find those PDFs, they might have said, well, how did he know it was my document? How did he know it was? So there is a much more robust searching tool within Drive now. So you may want to take a look at that. Excellent. Very good. Um, well, the last thing I'm going to mention before we go to Anthony with his uh, searching tidbit of the month. And again, guys, remind if you have any other questions, any other show and tell, please throw those in the Q&A. Throw them here. Um, we'll take a look at those. Um, recent blog posts been trying to put up several blog posts each week that are Google related or maybe tech related um, I have uh, been putting all these on the website uh, controlaltachieve.com uh, that's where I'm putting all of these at um, and some of the recent ones that we won't go into great detail on at all but just be aware of um, did one on six awesome uses of revision history. So if you have not been taking advantage of revision history, remember Google Docs saves everything. Every change anybody ever makes to a document or a slideshow or a spreadsheet or a drawing, who made the change, the date and time of the change. This talks about how revision history works and then how you can use it to track student improvements, restore previous versions, view their work process, evaluate group work, detect plagiarism and cheating, and investigate harassment and inappropriate use. So it's a great tool. Make sure our teachers are taking good advantage of that. I uh, did one here on adding integers with Google Drawings. Uh, so this is uh, a little um, Google Drawing template I put together that allows you to model um, I'll make a copy of it here so we can actually see it. Model adding positive and negative numbers together. So if you wanted to say, hey, let's go in here and let's say we wanted to add a negative 7 
plus a positive for what you can do is the negatives are yellow. So let me zoom out a little bit here, see if I can get that to fit in the screen a little bit better. Oops, zoom out, not in, oops. Oh, that's okay. We'll try to, there we go, now I can see it. Um, so I could grab seven negatives, and then I can grab four positives. And once I get them in, I'll zoom back in so you can see this. There we go. And now what you do is you say if you got seven negatives and four positives, adding integers, adding positives and negatives, for each positive that you have, if you add that to a negative, watch what happens. It changes color. It goes from red positive, yellow negative, to orange neutral. It kind of neutralizes it out. A plus one and a minus one is nothing. And so you can demonstrate for students, you can actually model what it looks like to add positives to negatives by taking these colored chips and putting them on top of each other. And when you're all done and there's no more chips to combine, whatever you're left with, one, two, three yellows, so that's three negatives. So that means we're left with a negative three when we're done. So a positive seven, excuse me, a negative seven and a positive four equals a negative three. And you could do this to demonstrate up in front of the class. You could put it on a smart board, let them move things around, or the kids could get their own copy, push it out through classroom, and have them experiment with this while they're learning adding integers. Eric, I've never tried it before, but when you're dragging in drawings, if you hold the control key down with snap to grid more, will it will try and center itself up? Easier. Uh, the snap to grid, that depends on the view. If you're using grid or guidelines, yeah. you have to set that. If you hold the control key down, it doesn't act the same way as it does when you're going a circle. And the only thing is holding the shift key down shift can key keep right. you in line. Yeah. So you're staying horizontal or vertical. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, a couple other ones that recently got posted in there um, that might be worth checking out. We've got, um, let me see. Um, why should schools use Google Apps instead of personal Google accounts? Most people here are probably Google Apps districts, so I don't think that's going to apply to you, but it's a list of like 40 benefits, like 40 plus benefits you get when you're using Google Apps for education rather than a personal account, why you might wanna do that. And um, so that, um, that one might be good for a school that's still investigating. Well, why don't we just use personal Gmail? Why do we have to go to Google Apps? And basically we go through all these different programs and how they're different, what makes them better in Google Apps for Ed, the extra tools you get, the extra features you get that you don't normally get in just regular uh, regular Gmail account. Uh, the Jeopardy template, that's an old one, but I put it back out there on the new site. Uh, it's just a uh, Google Slides template you can copy and use uh, to create your own Jeopardy games for class, so that's fun. Um, let's see, anything else there? Um, oh, if you're a math teacher, we've got a bunch of math ones here. Uh, the best virtual protractor and ruler that I've come across, um, the uh, ruler is called Edge, the web ruler, and the protractor is called MB ruler for Chrome. And basically, uh, Edge, the web ruler, will pop up a floating virtual ruler that you can drag all around the screen, switch it from inches to centimeters to pixels, make it go vertical or horizontal, and it lets you measure right there on your screen. Um, about 15 more minutes, we should be wrapping up here. 10, 15, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the one on the um, protractor, same idea. It's an extension. You click it, and it pops up a virtual protractor that you can drag all around your screen. You can rotate it. You can make it bigger or smaller. I think both of these are great, especially with uh, the standardized uh, next generation assessments our kids need to do, that they need to be used to using floating rulers and floating protractors to be able to take the math assessments that they're gonna be seeing as the, uh, for the state tests. But they're also just great if you wanna go digital. Maybe you don't have a bunch of rulers and protractors in your class. Maybe kids forget them or break them. This is another way if you're trying to do a digital activity, you don't have to take a physical ruler or protractor and put it on top of your screen and scratch up your screen. <laughs> you can just use a virtual one to move around on your screen. Uh, and then let's see, uh, there's another post here recently on how to play YouTube videos safely in school. 
lot of times there's wonderful things on YouTube that we want to share with our kids, but maybe we don't want to get the ads or the suggested videos that don't that aren't always appropriate. <laughs> After the video ends, we talk about using a tool called View Pure, which you feed it the YouTube video link and it creates a new link for you that allows you to just show the video to the kids with no ads, no related videos, no suggested videos, just the clean video by itself. But then we also talked about inserting videos into slideshows and embedding videos into your website as well as other ways to accomplish this. So if you're looking for ways to encourage teachers to use YouTube in school, this gives them some ideas on how they can do it without the other stuff that could come along with the YouTube video. And um, I did put a link out to our uh, language arts graphic organizers. Recently, I did some training on using Google Drawings for language arts. And in doing so, I put together a whole nother batch of new graphic organizers. I've been doing graphic organizers in Google, in Google Drawings for quite a while, but I didn't have necessarily a lot of language arts ones. So I created a whole bunch of new ones, compare and contrast, story maps, um, sandwich charts, word study diagrams, cause and effect, main idea and details, character description. So all of these are now available in this folder that has, um, I think over 40 graphic organizers now. So you can go into any of these, uh, use them. They're all freely available, basically, if you find one that you like here. So one of the newer ones may be uh, the character description one. Come in and grab that graphic organizer. Just come up here to the top right where it says pop out pop out. If you click the little pop out button, it'll open it in its own new window. They are view only, so you will have to make a copy. So once you get it opened, you will need to make a copy. So you've got your own copy of that graphic organizer to use with your kids, have your kids fill it out and so forth. And then I think the last one that I had on here was uh, long multiplication with Google Sheets. Uh, one of my sons has been working on long multiplication. Now, I just call it multiplication, but I guess now it's called long multiplication because you're actually working it out, filling out each of the steps like this. There's other ways to do multiplication now besides that. This is the traditional long multiplication, uh, but there's a lot of steps involved in it. So I did create a um, two Google Sheets that allow you to again go in and make a copy. And after you make a copy of it, you fill in the original problem and then you start filling in the answers. And as you do, it tells you if you're right or wrong because I've got formulas built into here where it does the multiplication in the background and it will mark in red anything that you put in incorrectly. So it takes the kids through step by step, multiplying by the ones digit, multiplying by the tens digit, adding all that up. And anytime they type in something that's not right, it colors it red so they're aware of that. So those are just some of the recent ones from that blog. Please feel free to just take any of the stuff from there. That's what it's there for. Share that out with your staff. Send them to that. Send them to those links. I will try to continue to put about uh, three or so posts a week. Uh, it won't be probably every day, but I'll try to get uh, something educationally valuable on there for you guys each week. And that's it for my stuff. Anthony, why don't you chat a little bit about um, your stuff? I see you've got uh, a link here to your world language resources, and then you're going to talk about uh, searching. So Yes, um, Eric, if you click on that link. Um, the only reason why I popped the world language one in there is, is we were talking a lot about recording and uh, playing back voices. So I did a session on Friday for our, um, Tuesday for our world language instructors in our county and they wanted some things on recording so in the middle of there there's a bunch of tools as far as recording and playing back and adding comments and the one i mentioned before is that the black one that says talk and comment right there mm -hmm. um, so there's some things out there available and um, just thought that might be helpful for some people all right excellent and then uh as far as the search and tell yes this month uh, most people think of Google as that little block that has a doodle above it, which is always interesting. But there's actually a, over 20 different Google search tools. And I'm not going to call them all Google Sites, but we're going to call them tools. And it, the picture there, unfortunately, does not have live links in it. But when you click on the link or use the tiny URL, 
um, it will bring you to it. So Eric's going to click on that right now and you'll see the live version of it. And what I'd like to do today is just let's take a real quick look a couple of them. Let's take a look at Google Trends in the middle at the top. This is a way to find out what searches are popular on Google, and you can look at different time periods. For right now, they have Explore 2015 at the top, so if you want to see the year in review, see what was popular, or if you want to see what's going on right now, what people are searching for. And I think it's a great um, sort of current events type of thing uh, for your classroom. And they have a map. So there's a wide variety of different things. So a lot of people are searching for winter storms right now, so it shows you a map. There's some. NFL information because of the playoffs, and it's just timely information. These, for those of you that have been around for a little while, this used to be called Google Zeitgeist, and this is just the modified version of Google Zeitgeist, and um, I like Zeitgeist name, but Trends makes it a little easier for people to figure out. The second one I wanted you to click on is the, in the yellow. The yellow section, before you click on it though, I just want to mention, this takes you to the traditional Google search page in many cases but it shows you some of the special features. Let's click on advanced search. This is the, the Google search page, the advanced search. This used to be very easy to get to. Now you have to go down to the help section of the regular page to get to it. So I provide you a link here. Again, I think this is one of the easiest ways for younger students uh, to be able to search because you take out all that plus minus quotes, et cetera. You simply type in what you want. And then also you have some options and there are your choices. Now, many of these options have been added to the regular search tool, uh, just below it under this, uh, on this regular search. So if you just pop over to regular Google search for a second. So you're saying like if I put in, I want to search for penguins, yes. but I don't want to search for Pittsburgh. Yes. Makes it very easy to do a search. Then if I run a search off of that, I'm just getting penguins. I'm not getting any of the, the yes. hockey stuff. Now, so notice across the top, they've added some of these tools under the section that says search tools, down a little bit lower, well, just search right there. So they've snuck some of these in. But those tools are both available from the advanced search page and much easier to get to. So again, uh, you can use this little link. If you uh, want to remember it, I put a tiny URL down there right below it. Um, and it's um, on back on our document. It says tiny.cc slash. Unfortunately, goo goo was not available. So it's goose with two S's. Oh, so, so down here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that gets you there. Okay. Yeah, you can goose your way there if you'd like. Okay, sure, <laughs> sure. That's fine. And then just to mention on the bottom here, uh, all the little search and tells that I do each month usually come from my website, which Eric has branded. This is Eric's branding of the Web Resource Hoarder site. And again, I made a little tiny shortcut for that. So you can just pop over there in a second if you want to go hoard some resources. Whoops. Nope. That's yeah. not it. That's that's actually it, but the link is no, not. Yeah, the yeah. link's not right. Link's there. not right. I'll fix the link. Oh, that fixed the link. Yeah. This should be where it goes, though. Yeah, right? That's it. All right. So that's right. just a bunch of stuff for you to explore. This weekend is going to snow a lot of places. Uh, so there's a way you can blow off the whole weekend. If you don't want to binge watch our webinars, you can you can binge search uh, <laughs> web resource hoarder site. All right. Well, that's all our, I have. As we wrap up, our next meeting is scheduled for February 19th. Uh, sometimes we have to move these around. So again, please always check this page. Remember the main link that's the most important link of everything here today is how to get to this stuff, google.apps.spark.org slash user group. And always check to see uh, things come up. I mean, you know, we'll get a training that we have to do. And so it's okay. So we move things around a little bit. Um, or it may have to be the afternoon instead of the morning. But at the moment, uh, next one should be February 19th in the morning. Um, I'll be here at Spark. Anthony, is that the one you're going yes. over to Marlington? I'm going to be in Marlington. So we're going to be in two locations that day. We're going to have a satellite one. Anthony will be there at Marlington. And uh, between now and then, we can work on some neat things that Marlington and, and can, can do to participate in that one there. If, you like. I'm also going to if it's closer for people to drive there, then come here. We'll add that in. We'll add in uh, the Marlington information. We're so going to have a student audience. Yes. So we're great. Student in the audience at Marlington. Love it. Uh, so that should be. Very love it, love it, love it. By the way, it. Eric, if you wanted, to, if you didn't want to go to these sites and find out about this information, you wanted to get reminded each month. Uh, are you talking about the newsletter? Yes. 
Yeah, we do have in our, I think it's probably in the important links. Yes, it is. So uh, as we wrap things up, a couple, couple reminders to you as far as the important links go. Yes, there is a newsletter um, at our tech integration site. You can go there to sign up. It's not often, it's like once a month. It's just a nice friendly reminder of upcoming things and stuff that happened in the last month. Please feel free to sign up for that. And if for any reason you didn't sign in today, if you're watching this recorded later, if you got here late on the live one, that's fine. Right here under important links is a sign-in form uh, that allows us to give you a PDF certificate of attendance to prove you were here. It gives you two hours of uh, two contact hours to turn into LPDC, but it also allows me to report this to Google. They don't need to know your. Uh, I don't give. I don't give them your email address. That's just for me to send you the certificate of attendance. I have to send them numbers as to how many people take part in the meetings. So please do sign in so I can report the numbers to them, that is, uh, that is helpful. Uh, other than that, any last things? Yes? Just a question. Sure. And this has been gone for a while, but um, when he was talking about the Google search and search tools, underneath search tools, and you click on that, um, you would get, you have any time, and then you have all results. And they used to have reading levels. Yes, like that's, you're what right. Happened you're right. To them? They were just gone. You time. are absolutely correct. So yeah, you know, if you go in, and you run a search, you are right. There used to be the option here to pick um, websites and articles that fit a certain reading level. That has been gone for probably about a year, I'm going to say. Um, it had a lot of people very upset when that disappeared. I've never heard anything to indicate why it left or why it's coming back or when it's ever coming back, if it is. So reading level? You're right. That's not there anymore. I think it's a great option. No, no, it just disappeared. Yeah, that's that's the same experience we've all had with that. And unfortunately, I do not have any info to give you on that. And that's one of the things that also has disappeared from the advanced search page. They still have other things by region and by site and by domain, but that has also disappeared from the advanced search. Although the one thing on the advanced search, you can see whether the safe search is turned on or not when you're doing that. So that does give you a little bit of appropriate, but not reading level. Well, no. anything else, folks? Questions, comments, things to share. All right. Well, please uh, take advantage of all the resources we got here. Make sure you participate in our Spark uh, community online, our GEG Ohio community online. And uh, thanks so much for everybody being here today. Have a great weekend. It's Friday. Yes. Excellent. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care.